dudettes and dudes, welcome back. This is episode 119, 119 of The Anxious Truth. Thanks for coming by. Welcome to the show. Today, our topic is often requested, generalized anxiety disorder, GAD. Uh, we're going to talk about that today. And the good news is we're going to talk about it with a special guest, uh, Dr. Dave Carbonell. David Carbonell came by and was gracious enough to give us about 30 minutes of his time and his expertise and his experience. It's a great conversation. I know you guys are going to dig it, especially if you're dealing with generalized anxiety. Uh, Dr. Dave was it was outstanding. You guys are going to love this. So you can find him at anxietycoach.com. Uh, Dr. Carbonell is a licensed clinical psychologist. He's licensed in the state of Illinois and in the state of New York here in the United States. Uh, and he is also he's a therapist and a teacher. And he is also an author. He wrote four anxiety books. Those include uh, the panic attacks workbook, the worry trick, which is excellent for those of you who are dealing with GAD, uh, the fear of flying workbook, which is clearly aimed at people who have a fear of flying and outsmart your anxious brain, 10 simple ways to beat the worry trick. All great books, great resources, go check him out at anxietycoach.com. Tell him I said hi. Uh, again, thanks to Dr. Carbonell for taking the time to really, really, really give some great information today. You guys are going to dig it. Before we get started with him, I just quick reminder, my book, The Anxious Truth, A Step-by-Step -Step Guide to Understanding and Overcoming Anxiety, Panic, and Agoraphobia is available at my website, theanxioustruth.com slash recovery guide. If you haven't checked it out, go check it out. That's all I'm going to say. I don't want to step on Dr. Carbonell here. This is really his episode. So let's get cooking. We talked about uh, generalized anxiety disorder, GAD, what it is, how you treat it, what's the difference between GAD and panic disorder and agoraphobia, and there's just a ton of great information. And at the end, you'll hear us say that if you have any questions that you would like to ask Dr. Carbonell, you can get him on his website. Uh, but if you'd like to send them in on the Facebook group or on my Instagram, whatever it is, I can try and aggregate them. He was gracious enough to say that he would try to answer some questions. So if you'd like to do that, that's fine. Uh, let's get cooking. I hope you guys really enjoy it. Thanks again for coming by. I will see you afterwards. Okay, guys, joining us is Dr. David Carbonell, all the way from Chicago, I believe. Yes, that's right. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, Dave has written quite a few books, at least three that I'm aware of on the topic of anxiety disorders and treating anxiety disorders. Uh, he is a PhD level clinical psychologist who specializes in these things. And any of you who have been following me, who have said the name David Carbonell to me many, many times, I'm happy to report he is sitting here with me virtually. So welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me. So what I wanted to talk about was uh, some of the differences between the disorders that I tend to discuss on the podcast, specifically the differences between panic disorder, agoraphobia on one side, and generalized anxiety disorder on the other. Because when I ask about generalized anxiety disorder, your name and your books come up all the time. Uh, and I thought it would be great for us to get to chat about what you see the differences being and, and how you approach them differently with your clients and, and, and patients. Sure, that, that, that's a great topic. And, and they are, you know, very, very different conditions, very different set of circumstances require a different approach. So th this is a great topic. Great, let's do it. So do you, I'll, I'll give you the floor and, and let's hear it. What do you think the main differences are from your experience and, and you know, your, your, your standpoint? Okay. Uh, well, uh, if we look at panic disorder, uh, the highlight of that uh, is that people, uh, at least initially, experience the panic in terms of physical sensations, uh, which they then, you know, c come to believe mean they're about to have some kind of catastrophe. They're going to die. They're going to go insane. They're going to uh, asphyxiate. They're going to collapse. Uh, they're going to faint, and so on. Physical sensations come out, uh, at least early on, seemingly out of the blue for no apparent reason, scare them into believing that, that they're going to have a calamity. And thereafter, they begin to worry about recurrences and try and protect against recurrences. And, you know, in, in that way uh, comes all the, uh, the, the phobias and the agoraphobia that's associated with panic disorder. Uh, and, and so the, the, the treatment there is, is a form of exposure in which you literally go out and practice having the panic sensations uh, and coming to understand and experience that, well, this is unpleasant, but I can work my way through it. And when you lose your fear of having a panic attack, that's when the panic attacks tend to go away. Excellent. Um, everybody's going to understand before. all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's, that's what they've been hearing for five years from me. So okay. excellent. <laughs> so with generalized anxiety disorder, then uh, you have a set of circumstances where the symptoms are much more, uh, almost exclusively experienced as worrisome thoughts. 
that the physical sensations are secondary uh, and attributable to the thoughts. Uh, so with generalized anxiety disorder, uh, we have a situation in which a person experiences recurrent worrisome thoughts about not just about having panic attacks, but about a wide variety of uh, potential circumstances. What if I get fired? What if my spouse leaves me? What if my kid flunks out and runs away? Well, what if the, uh, the, the furnace blows up in the, the middle of a South Dakota winter, that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, and they come to take those thoughts as sign of danger and get into a, a very conflictual relationship with their thoughts in, in which they're either uh, trying very hard to disprove them and, and uh, prove to themselves that they have some good uh, valid protection against this potential calamity, or they get into an argument with their thoughts and just try and make them shut up and go away. Mm. Uh, and they go back and forth between those two postures. Neither one is satisfactory. Neither one leads to a good resolution for them. And so they literally uh, progress down a path of becoming uh, afraid and conflicted with their own thoughts. Yeah, and that uh, tends to put them in that constantly agitated. So when you say the physical symptoms are secondary, you know, people will describe just constantly being wound up, constantly like they're right on the edge, right on the edge. They never actually panic, but they're constantly at that heightened state, heightened state of anxiety. That's right. And, and it's believed to be the case that that heightened state of anxiety comes from, this is what I mean when I say it's secondary, not, not so much that it's of less importance, but it's a reaction to uh, this inner turmoil of constantly working with your worrisome thoughts. Makes sense. Uh, and, and so in a sense, a person is literally getting heckled uh, by their own intrusive, uh, involuntary thoughts. Uh, and if you've ever seen, you know, a performer being heckled, you know, well, it makes a difference how you respond to the heckling. It does. You can never beat the heckler. I, I, I always say you can't argue with your lizard brain, but I kind of like your heckler analogy better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so the, the, the task for the GAD sufferer then is uh, to find literally uh, a more adaptive way of, rela of relating to the circumstance that, and this is true for all of us, I don't control my thoughts. And sometimes I have uh, unpleasant and antagonistic thoughts. And how can I establish an adaptive relationship with that that doesn't increasingly cause me to get worried that doesn't increasingly fill my body with physical tension and so on. How can I uh, find a way to live the life I want, even under the circumstance where I have thoughts that I wish I didn't? Yeah. So it's not, we're not ever trying to squash the thoughts, make them go away, make them stop, twist them into something different. And we can talk about thought suppression. Uh, we're sure, actually trying sure. to just learn a new, a new relationship with those thoughts. Yeah, all those things you just mentioned, those aren't, aren't part of the, the treatment or the recovery. Those are literally the problem. Yeah. Uh, that the person has gotten into this antagonistic uh, way of relating to their thoughts uh, to the, the extent that they're, they're constantly in an argument with themselves. Uh, you and, and you argue with yourself, there's no contest on the planet that's more evenly matched and that, that can go on forever. That's true. I think especially when some of those thoughts start to, uh, you know, kind of veer into the territory of irrationality, because uh -huh. you, you, you can't argue with irrationality by definition. It'll just keep throwing more irrationality at you. So right. it winds up putting people in great distress. Do you find in your travels and when you're dealing with your patients, your clients, is there a, almost a level of resistance to understanding that that's actually what's going on? Because I encounter people all the time that will insist, well, I don't have triggers. I don't, I just don't know why I'm like this. They, they seem so perplexed as to why they feel that way all the time. Uh, I, I do see that. Uh, I, I'm perplexed. I don't know why this happens. And, and also, um, this shouldn't happen. Uh, yes. This isn't normal. People, you know, literally believe that a man ought to be able to control what thoughts he has and what thoughts he doesn't have. Mm -hmm. uh, so both, both of those, those ideas, both of those beliefs uh, uh, lead people into trouble. Yeah. I, I think uh, relative to panic disorder, the, the, the triggers and the cues tend to be much more subtle, more difficult to observe. Um, but really, in the end, so what? Uh, that, that, that's going to be of less significance. We're not going to be as concerned with the triggers as we are with uh, how I relate to the presence of these thoughts. 
that makes all kinds of sense. So when you encounter somebody in this situation, what's your first step? Uh, one, one of the first steps I, I want to take is I, I want to help them, uh, and, and this sounds peculiar, I want to help them become more aware. I want to help them get better at catching themselves in the act uh, of having a thought. Uh, and at first glance, you might suppose, well, how hard can that be? They're already painfully aware of these thoughts, uh, but they don't usually catch it early enough. So I, I, I'd like you to visualize, we're going to take the classic GAD thought and uh, those of your listeners who are old enough, uh, we're going to diagram the sentence. Uh, oh, no. we used to... <laughs> yeah. oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm having flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, because I remember it very clearly. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, we're going to diagram the sentence, and there's two parts to the typical GAD sentence. We have the, the what-if clause on the left, and we have the catastrophe clause on the right. And, and this is the format of 99.9999 all the way down the block uh, percent of worrisome thoughts. What if something bad? What if something bad? And, and when people experience these thoughts, their attention immediately jumps to the catastrophe clause, the bad part, uh, the part where I lose my mind, I get sick, I lose my job, I go bankrupt, I, I, I'm alone and rejected, so on. Uh, without or really keying in on that first part of the sentence that says, what if? And Sorry, those are man. the most overworked words in the vocabulary of a, an anxiety and worry or suffer, those words, what if? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and a lack of ability to understand that, wait a minute, I'm thinking about something hypothetically that doesn't exist. Yes, yes, because the catastrophe clause part is so flamboyant, um, uh, you know, contains so much emotional power that people jump right past the, the first part uh, without pausing to notice it. And it's real important to catch yourself in the act of that first part uh, because, you know, I'm going to spend some time with this, with my clients on this. What do we mean when we say what if? What, what do those two words literally add to the sentence? Uh, and I'm going to suggest that ultimately these two words are the only important part of the sentence. That, because the catastrophe clause, that's fill in the blanks. Plug could be in anything. Catastrophe. Could be any, as long as it's bad. Yeah, right. uh, <laughs> very good. It's the only requirement. It has right, to be very right. bad. Yes. Right. You're not going to have, what if I win super Powerball and move to Tahiti? Not going to have that. No one ever stresses uh, over that. You're right. No. What if something bad? These are the mad libs of chronic anxiety. Fill in a catastrophe, any old catastrophe. So what are the words, what if, mean? Uh, well, I, I'd like to suggest that they mean something like this. Here's some terrible thing that isn't happening now, and why don't you pretend that it is? That's literally the offer, the gambit uh, of these what-if thoughts, to, to get your mind literally picturing this bad event and, and imagining how you would respond when people confront you. Why did you let that happen? Aren't you ashamed? Don't you wish you had done it differently? Uh, they, they start to feel it in their stomach and in their head and in their fingertips, what it would be like as they literally have a, a scary theater of the mind in which they picture uh, this God awful thing happening and, and all the responsibility they would have for it and the shame and the angst and the fear, uh, overlooking the fact that right at the top it says, hey, here's something that isn't happening now and why don't you pretend it? Yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I want to help people get better at noticing that invite and get better at taking a pass on it. I, I would throw in that in my experience, people get in that, they get trapped into that pattern. And some of the thinking is extremely catastrophic, but it uh -huh. sometimes seems like that thought pattern just starts to extend into all aspects of life. So even not being quite sure what to make for dinner, or if you're going to get a parking spot when you go to the movies becomes a catastrophe. Yes, like yeah. there's no, there's almost no scale of catastrophe anymore. Everything becomes part of the continuing theater of disaster. Yes. And, and somebody that, that takes that track, uh, well, they're going to find it very hard to make decisions at all uh, on, on trivial subjects because they're trying so hard to ensure uh, the impossibility of making any error. Yes. And of so course. these are protective mechanisms. Right. Let me keep myself right. safe from this disaster by modeling it and see what I would do. Yes, and, and in, in, in very ways very comparable to panic disorder and agoraphobia, there is an avoidance here, um, it, it, but it's an, an avoidance of uh, having these unpleasant thoughts dominate my attention. 
So if I could bring it in for just a quick second before we continue, and this is great. I'm so loving this. The so many people who will say, yeah, but the panic people, they're afraid. I'm not afraid. Well, they're not afraid necessarily of the, the state itself, but they are motivated by fear, I would say. It's the, the, that's why all the modeling and playing out these scenarios, I have to protect myself from those scenarios. Yes. And, and so if somebody says that to me, well, then, um, you know, as, as a psychologist, I, I have this advantage where I can say to them, well, remind me, uh, for what purpose did you come in? <laughs> what, what is it you're hoping to achieve? Yeah, right. Very and good. And while, while they may say, I'm not afraid and so on, we're going to go back to how bad they feel uh, and, and how avoidant they've become and, and what a struggle they get in with their own thoughts. And so then we can get back in track with the, the purpose for which they sought me out. That makes sense. So you get them to recognize this pattern of thinking that they're in. And where do we go from there? Uh, well, once they... Uh, they get better at catching themselves in the act. And I'll, I'll do uh, some silly kinds of things, really, to help people get better at this. I, I'll ask people to uh, uh, start carrying a box of the, the little candy mint Tic Tacs with them. Hmm. Uh, comes 60 or 100 to the bottle. Uh, and I'm going to ask people for a, a couple of weeks to get into the habit. Each time you notice a what-if thought, or each time you hear yourself say what-if to somebody else, I'd like you to take out your box of Tic Tacs and then take one out and you could eat it or you could flick it into the street, doesn't matter, but you're gonna use this to just keep count. How many what if thoughts do I have a day? Uh, do I have a one box a day habit? Do I have a 10 box a week habit? Uh, and so we're gonna use counting, not because we're gonna have a, uh, an important use for the number, but counting is a proxy for cultivating a more accepting attitude. Yeah. Uh, it's a more neutral, benign, okay, there's another one rather than, oh my God, that's terrible. Uh, right. There's, so I want to help them get better at, at cultivating a more accepting attitude and an observance of the what-if thoughts. Uh, and once somebody is in a position where they can be more consciously aware, catch it a little earlier in the act, then that gives them the opportunity to decide, well, how am I going to respond? If they don't notice it until they get to the catastrophe clause, well, already they're on high alert. Yeah, it's too late. Right, too late. Yeah, so really important for them to get better at catching that that little what if clause. Um, you know, years ago, uh, around 2000, uh, all across America, this would happen. You'd pick up the phone at dinner time, and it would be somebody saying, "I got some free magazines to give you." Uh, and until we had the no call law, well, this this went on. And if you heard free magazines and thought, "Oh, a free gift," well, you were going to get suckered into buying something you didn't want. Uh, and if you heard free magazines and realized sales call, you were probably going to come out of it all right. Yeah. So people uh, are going to benefit tremendously with the ability to notice, oh, here it is again. Here's that what if thought. So then you have that awareness built. Now you're, you're literally teaching somebody how to confront their bad thinking habit, if you will, I guess. Um, um, it, well, it, to do something with the bad, I, I, I probably wouldn't go so far as to call it confront because They've already been confronting the heck out of it. They've been arguing with it. They've been fighting with it. They've been telling it to shut up and go away. They've been slapping themselves up top of the head. Stop thinking that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They, they, if confrontation was going to work, I'd be out of business. That's a good point. That's an yeah. and I would have no podcast. We would <laughs> right. just be hopefully telling jokes somewhere and making people laugh. That's but right. uh, yeah, exactly. So what's what comes after this? And I love the Tic Tac thing. I bet you people are surprised that how empty that box of Tic Tacs is at the end. Yeah, of the yeah, yeah. And I always mention to people, you know, don't be surprised. The number is going to be higher than you expect. Uh, well, I mean, be surprised, but don't be dismayed. That's still the good news because now uh, the, the number has been that high all along, all along. The only thing that's different now is you're getting better at catching it in the act earlier. Mm. Uh, and so when you do catch it in the act, um, you know, ac across the board with a lot of my work, uh, we, we deploy uh, the rule of opposites with respect to chronic anxiety. Um, my gut instinct of how to respond to moments of panic and high anxiety tends to be dead wrong, tends to be something that gets me more in trouble. And so I'm always encouraging people to notice their instinctive reply and consider what would be the opposite of that. Yeah. And then here with GAD, the opposite of confronting it is going to be to play with it. Uh, that, that's, we're going to look for a more 
uh, accepting and playful response to the arrival of these thoughts in my mind, which might be goofy, which might be what you want to call irrational or unrealistic or exaggerated mm-hmm. or, or disgusting or what have you. We don't get to pick and choose what thoughts we have. Thoughts arise unbidden. Uh, and when I have thoughts that aren't uh, particularly uh, useful or helpful to me, I can't simply abolish them. If I get into a fight with them, they're just going to be more persistent and bothersome. I want to find some way to play with them uh, and, and let them diffuse on their own. So that's the direction we're going to go in. Which makes a whole lot of sense. Let's talk for a minute, because I know you've written about this, about the use of tools like uh, basic meditation, relaxation, focus skills. Uh, you know, I, I see you bring those into the discussion, especially when you're talking about things like excessive worry. Mm-hmm. Is this part of the package that you're usually bringing? Like we have to learn some new skills here to help us do this, this new thing? That, that, that's a part of the, the, the background of the package. You know, I, mm-hmm. I certainly want, want people, uh, if they have any trouble with their breathing, to learn a good breathing exercise. And I, I think it's very useful for people to, who, you know, who are motivated and willing to do this to learn a, a meditative or, or a relaxation exercise. Uh, I'm going to suggest those to, to people in the same spirit that you might take a daily vitamin. Yes. Um, I just do that for its good overall purposes. I don't, I don't do those things to respond to a, a concrete instance of worry. Uh, I just do those for their overall good effect on my life. Yeah, I always say those are not panic shields. Don't look at them that way. They're just exactly. the things that, to know how to do. Good way to put it. Yeah, I like that. So th- this is just something I do. I, you know, I, I watch my cholesterol. I, I keep a, you know, my food intake with this. I exercise. These are just good life maintenance things. And meditation and relaxation uh, belong in that category. Uh, different than from what to do when I get a, what if some awful catastrophe thought? Uh, there I want to have some way of noticing, oh, oh, it almost caught me. It almost got me hooked. I could feel the hackles in my back, you know, getting ready to argue with this. Uh, and then I want to have some more playful response to that. Uh, so what, what do I mean by playful responses? And some of these, uh, I have to tell you, are going to, you know, uh, also sound silly. Um, but I'm I, a fan. I think, yeah, silly is good if yeah. you're dealing with unrealistic thoughts. Uh, I don't want to take an unrealistic thought realistically. Uh, I don't want to argue with the thought that I recognize there's something wrong with that. Uh, all right, we're in unrealistic land now. We're in silly land now. Okay, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. I have a silly thought. I'm going to treat it silly. Uh, So I'm always asking people to make poems out of their worry. Oh, that's Uh, pretty cool. Yeah, this is a really interesting one. uh, Specifically, I'll I'll suggest to people to make a haiku out of the content of their worry. Uh, Just a a little haiku, five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables, three lines of unrhymed verse. and it's interesting what happens when people take uh, the really unpleasant sometimes content of their what if thought and put it into a haiku form. It kind of transforms their reaction. Now they're more focused on uh, how can I get seven the syllable line? It's not fitting. You know, they're, they're treating it more like a crossword puzzle uh, than like a threat. Uh, if haiku's not your thing, uh, well, uh, limericks are just as good. There, there sure. once was a gal from Nantucket, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, putting it into song, uh, making, making songs out of your worry. It, it, in all kinds of ways, doing something playful with the content of the worry that doesn't particularly involve trying to act on the content, believing the content, taking the content seriously. I'm just going to take this thought and respond to it for what it really is, an anxious symptom. Yeah. These, what, these what if thoughts mean the same thing as sweaty palms. They mean I, I'm nervous. I would add to that, you know, those responses that you're saying, well, you know, we don't want to do, we're going to do these playful things instead. I would add running away from the thoughts too, because people also tend to try to do things to drown them out and distract themselves. And I think people might get a little bit confused. I'm going to make up songs and riddles and limericks but you're not asking them to distract themselves because they're still interacting with the thoughts to build that new relationship. Yeah. Very important point. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, I I absolutely want to help people see that, no, I I need to play with the thoughts rather than get away from them. So we're not doing any distraction here. We're not doing God forbid, any thought stopping, uh, snapping a rubber band on your wrist, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, we're going to literally play with the thoughts. I'll, 
Uh, one of the, the, the things I'll ask people to do with, uh, on an ongoing basis uh, is to schedule worry appointments. I'm going to schedule worry appointments, typically two 10 minute uh, appointments a day that I set aside to do my worrying. Uh, and, and for that 10 minutes, I'm going to schedule a time when I'm alone, when I don't have to be looking after the children or the dog, don't have to answer the phone or the door. Uh, I can have quiet, I can have privacy, uh, and I'm going to fill that 10 minutes with my worry. What if this and what if that and what if these other things? And I'm going to do it out loud and I'm going to do it in front of a mirror so I can hear myself worrying and I can see myself worrying. Uh, I'm going I'm to fill that 10 minutes as full to the brim as I can with all my what if stuff. Uh, and so why would somebody do this? Well, the potential payoff is this. Uh, as you develop that habit and you come to know, yeah, in my heart of hearts, I'm going to show up and I'm going to do that appointment. I, you know, I'm not going to cancel it. I'm not going to conveniently forget it. I'm not going to blow it off. Uh, I'm going to show up and do that as unpleasant as it is. Uh, that tends to give people pretty good postponing power the rest of the day. Yeah. When they yeah. find themselves caught up in it, they can stop and say, well, do I need to worry about this now or can this wait until my four o'clock worry appointment? Uh, yeah, either one is good. I like the idea of the say it out loud, say it in the mirror. There's a whole element of sort of ERP in that, that I, you know, it, you're mm -hmm. taking the, yeah. So when you see the reality of like, well, I really don't look so bad when I'm saying these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not as bad as I think it is in my head. So I, I'm digging that. I really am. Yes. Yeah. So we're, we're getting them out of their head and then they can see what they look like, what it hears, uh, what, what it sounds like. Um, it's quite surprising what a difference this makes. Now, needless to say, uh, you know, at, at first glance to a lot of people, this sounds like, well, that's the last thing on earth I would want to do. You know, Doc, right. I came to you to get these thoughts out of my head. Uh, but this is actually the way to defang them uh, and, and to relegate them to some, you know, uh, occasional nuisance rather than a life force that you have to wrestle with. Exactly. And in the end, you know, if we bring it back to the, you know, comparing and contrasting with things like panic disorder and agoraphobia, when I tell somebody, well, if you're terrified to get in the car and drive away, you're going to have to practice doing that and mm -hmm. experience the panic that comes with that in a new way. They don't want to hear that either. Like, no, no, no. I, that, that's exactly what I don't want to do. So there yeah. are similarities just, you know, maybe a little bit more cognitively based on the GAD side and behaviorally based on the panic disorder side. Although there's overlap, I'm sure. Yeah, oh, very, very similar. You know, if we had somebody say, even with a specific phobia, a fear of dogs, uh, well, somebody wants to lose their fear of dogs, uh, ultimately the treatment's gonna mean we're gonna have to spend some time with dogs. Uh, and if you have GAD, these what if thoughts, these are your dogs. Uh, and, and so it's, it's the same notion of exposure and desensitization, getting used to this, defanging it by not running away and not protecting myself and, and coming to see, hmm. however unpleasant it was, it, it didn't have the, the destructive power I thought it did. Yeah, it makes a difference. I'd like to bring up maybe two more things before we wrap it up because we don't usually mm -hmm. like to go more than about 30 minutes. Let's talk about, I want to talk about success rates, but then I also want to talk about uh, the things that people seem to bring to the table with GAD underneath that, that I can sometimes see. And it's to the benefit of crowdsourcing, just having a lot of people in my community. Their worry, somebody who has GAD often will tell, tell me that they don't have triggers, they don't have fears, but they will also happily describe themselves as warriors, overthinkers, and perfectionists. So we've talked about the worrying. Let's, overthinking is probably in the similar situation. Perfectionism seems to be a, a tremendous driver too, unless I'm missing something. Have you encountered that as a common theme? Well, you don't have to be a perfectionist to worry, but it, it sure helps. <laughs> it, it really helps. That should be on a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, uh, because sure, if you're a perfectionist, well, uh, that probably means you know outcome is good enough. Uh, yeah, I, I can't quite get the perfect, uh, the perfect outcome, and, and so therefore I'm already beaten. You know, I'm yeah, I'm thinking of, of, of a woman now. Uh, who, uh, what is the phrase she hates so much? Oh, that that's the phrase she hates so much, uh, uh, and it baffles her this notion of good enough. And, and, and she will tell me nothing is good enough. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you never get to good enough. <laughs> it, it's like, you know, the, 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 the donkey with the carrot on a stick and, and the donkey never quite gets to the carrot. Uh, yeah. He has to walk forever. Uh, that's the, the task that GAD inflicts upon these people. 
nothing is ever good enough. Yeah, no yeah, it's an so, endless search. Right, right. Yeah. So no matter how successful they are, not good enough. Not good enough. That's the but, burden of perfectionism. Yeah, it's definitely insidious. And it's when you uncover that, sometimes somebody's really taken aback. Like, oh, well, because if you're, then it's like, well, I'm actually failing because I'm a perfectionist. It's this crazy meta kind of thing and mm -hmm. it makes it even worse for them. Like, I'm looking mm -hmm. for perfectionism and I suck at it. So that, that's, yeah. that's the worst thing you want to hear. But and I, uh, and I can't even do a good job of getting my thoughts to relax and right. off my back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It becomes very self referencing in a way. So let's yeah. talk about the idea. I, I've heard people say, you know, I was told that if I have generalized anxiety disorder, I can never make it go away. I can only hope to manage it for the rest of my life. You have, a, you have a thought on that? Well, you know, people will hear that about panic attacks, too. That's true. Um, and I, and that, that's just half of the equation here. Uh, I, I think what, what's hopefully trying to be said by that is this. Um, the, the solution to panic attacks, the solution to this kind of chronic GAD worry, uh, isn't to get rid of it. It's to learn how to work with it in a more accepting and agreeable way. And as you do that, as you lose your fear, either of the, the panic attacks on, on the panic disorder side or, or the intrusive what if thoughts uh, on the GAD side, it's only as you lose your fear of those symptoms that then they begin to fade. Uh, so a, a, a nice remission and a nice departure of those symptoms is possible, but it doesn't tend to come until you've actually lost your fear of the symptoms. As long yeah. as you're afraid of them and protecting, they're going to persist. Uh, so I, the, the, the phrase that you mentioned, you know, well, they're, they're never going to go away. That, that's leaving out the, the good side. They're not going right. to go away on, as long as you're still afraid of them. So how can we work with these so you become less afraid? Yeah, which tends to magically make them sort of go away, or at least a very large, a very large decrease I've discovered over time. So yes, yeah, a very large decrease. Again, we don't want to be perfectionistic and look for right, right. The complete <laughs> absence of these thoughts. That's not going to happen. I have these kinds of thoughts. Everybody has unpleasant, irrational, crazy kinds of thoughts. It's part of the human condition. Uh, people with GAD aren't really having uh, so much a different menu of thoughts. It's more that they've become more antagonized uh, and responsive to these thoughts than your average Joe that has a, a goofy or wild thought and just blows it off and goes yeah, on. Yeah, lets it go. Very, very, very helpful. I so appreciate you having taken the time for this. I know that you have probably answered a tremendous number of questions that people have about GAD in my audience, and I'm grateful that you have done this. How can somebody find you if they're looking for you online? Where can they follow along with you? Because I would suggest they do that immediately. Oh, well, thanks. The best way to find me is on my website uh, at anxietycoach.com. Very good. I will uh, link that in the show notes for this episode, which will be at theanxioustruth.com slash 119. And uh, if people have questions, I'm happy to take the questions. Is it okay if I were to pass them along here and there? Uh, if you'd sure. be willing to answer them, that would be great. Uh, sure, that would be fine. I, I you know, I, I, I have a, this, a little note on my website. You know, there's a way that people can contact me there and Great. It's a little bit of a disclaimer. I mentioned, you know, I get more questions that I can answer, but okay. so here, you know, I if get you make it. it concrete, you make it specific, I'll do the best I can. Uh, yep. if, if you can bundle them together and show me the, the ones in common, uh, I'd be happy to take a shot at that. I absolutely appreciate you doing that. Again, thank you so much, Dave, for the time. And uh, I would welcome you back anytime you want to do it. So yeah, well, again. likewise, I enjoyed talking with you. You're clearly right on top of the subject. So it, it's nice to be questioned so effectively. Well, I appreciate that. All right. Have a great day. Thanks for coming by. All right. You take care. All right. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Somebody told me that you do or die, but I believe all you can do is try. And as the city stands 10 stories high, I'm going to live my life. It's all around you. You can breathe it in. And this is where your story begins. You got the feeling that you're going.